deter governments, you know, overreaching and stretching their powers that are going to be really strong. So um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the bylaw itself was passed um, with very little, my understanding is no public input. Um, no one attended public meetings because it was never really given notice that this was something that the municipality had changed. That this is a particular targeting of property owners where tenants are the consumer is never really something that was raised until the bylaw was passed. That was my understanding. However, you know, the municipality did comply with the technical um, requirements to provide notice, so I don't think that that's proper avenue to count. The big meat of the challenge would be on municipalities' attempt to extend their powers. So, Section 398 of the Municipal Act, um, I'm probably going to have to have so you guys can follow along with me, um, gives the municipality the authority to collect a debt. So, there's two subsections. So, Section 1 talks about what, how they can constitute debt. So, fees and charges imposed by municipality or local board on a person constitute debt to the person, of the person to the municipality or local board. And then subsection two talks about adding a, a debt to the tax roll. So reading it that way, the municipality is attempting to look at sec, subsection two alone and look at, in the case of fees or charges to supply a public utility, imposing those on the property to which the public utility is supplied. That's essentially where the municipality is stating that they get their ability to do everything. The municipality is a creature of statute and they're, they're strictly limited in what they can do to their authority in the municipal act or other pieces of legislation passed by the federal government. So this is where the municipality is trying to get their authority. Other municipalities are doing the same thing, they're doing it in different ways there. So what I looked at was the way the specific wording with the Elmer bylaw is different from other municipalities. And it is. So, in particular, so what it comes down to in the case of Elmer is Section 6.1 of your bylaw. Um, it starts off the, the relevant section or section is the town treasurer will add outstanding fees and charges imposed by this bylaw to the tax roll for the property in the same manner as municipal taxes. Now this is different than the City of London's bylaw. So the City of London's bylaw says that where there's the statutory authority to do so, the city treasurer may add the fees and charges imposed by this bylaw to the tax roll in the same of the property in the same manner as municipal tax returns. So the London bylaw specifically notes that there must be statutory authority to do so. What our position would be is that where the property owner is not the person who holds the debt, that is where the landlord doesn't have the debt, there is no statutory authority to add debt to the tax roll of the property. That would be the position that we would take there. There are other um, municipal bylaws that I've pulled out. The City of Toronto bylaw, for instance, states explicitly that the owner shall be liable for the payment of the bill. Period. The owner is liable for the payment of the bill. So then, when they're instituting their authority for the debt, it's the owner that has the debt. Although the tenant may get a copy of the bill, it's the owner's debt. Um, there are other examples out there. The City of. Um, sorry? Okay. Um, so the reason that we look at other municipalities and how they're exercising these powers is that there really hasn't been a challenge of this exercise before. While municipalities across the province are attempting to do this, no one's challenged it yet. So the, uh, by challenge, I mean a specific application to court to block a bylaw. So if we're looking at doing that, you have one year from the day the bylaw is passed. So you have you know, the clock's ticking now, but the, a lot of times we want to wait until later on in the process so we get the evidence that we need to support an application. So that we have real world evidence to show a judge to demonstrate why this is so unfair, why this isn't working. Those kinds of considerations we have to do. So, 
in looking to bring an application to quash this specific bylaw, it would have to be within a year of when the bylaw was passed. And there are only two grounds to quash it. The first is that it's illegal. And one of the ways it can be illegal is that it's called the virus, meaning it's exceeding the jurisdiction given to the municipality. So it's exceeding their authority, which would be the strongest argument from a preliminary review of the bylaw. It would be that the language used in this specific bylaw oversteps what other municipalities. It's inappropriate to use the word. It doesn't give them the authority to say the best. The other argument, the other way to quash a bylaw is to argue that it's done in bad faith. Frankly, bad faith is in the norm for a period of time. It's such a high bar to prove that a council acted in bad faith that it's really, you know, in my opinion, probably not worth pursuing. We look into it, definitely, but that's not where the real chance of success is. The real chance of success is in actually challenging the way these municipalities, and particularly this municipality, is attempting to exercise their authority. Now, that just deals with this specific bylaw. That doesn't mean that council couldn't go and pass a bylaw identical to that of another municipality where it is working as a stronger bylaw of requiring the landlords to be the ones to contract and then to with tenants so that the landlord is the one who has the debt. It doesn't prevent that. All it does is deal with this specific bylaw. So the other option is through a lobbying effort, which Kayla will talk about how she's organizing other municipalities across the province, and the attempt is to stop this practice from going on. So the reason, I'll give you a bit of background. The reason that this is big news now, that prior to 2003, municipal acts, prior to municipal acts, there are two leading decisions out there, Tennis Night Review and Embrace Road, where it went to court for municipalities to try to review it. And the Court of Appeal and the Superior Court both said, no, the consumer is the tenant, not the landlord. You cannot make the landlord responsible for the tenant's debt. Municipalities are in the best position to determine what the tenant is serving, and they have the ability to shut off water and use enforcement mechanisms, you know, take security deposits, do all those kinds of things that I know you know and that you're thinking and that, you know, counsel should have been thinking about as well. So that's the previous judicial history. But then the legislation changed, and we got Section 398. And now we're dealing with councils across the province trying to exercise those powers and, frankly, trying to make landlords debt collectors for their debt rather than taking some responsibility for managing municipal water services. So at this point, I can answer some questions about the legal work to challenge this specific bylaw, about the law in general, and if you want to talk eventually about the meaning of the issue in 